uh, Deborah Wynn Smith, please, to, to take the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm absolutely delighted to be here at Duffy for the inaugural economic forum. I want to congratulate you, Simeon, for your leadership. You're a true innovator in bringing us all here together at this uh, very historic place of Delphi to really chart a future for Greece. Um, being here is very special to me personally because I had the opportunity many years ago to live and study in Greece and actually do my advanced graduate work in archaeology and excavated at two Bronze Age sites in Laconia. And so I've really had a lifelong love and continue to nurture my personal passion for the Aegean Bronze Age world. And I really believe that that is the foundational core of our Western civilization. So I thought I might presage my remarks um, on looking at the global competitiveness landscape, what are the drivers for growth, and then posit a few thoughts um, on some of the opportunities here in Greece by really looking back at the Bronze Age. We had this wonderful uh, speech this morning from Professor Helen that I thought was just brilliant. But she didn't talk about the Bronze Age, so I thought I would, would add to that discussion where past is really prologue to the future. And I really think that if you look at Aegean civilization and the accomplishments, then in many ways we can say that that civilization was a prototype for the 21st century conceptual economy in which we now lead. Now why do I say that? Well, they, this was a culture in which imagination and ideas and insights and innovation really were at the heart of everything they did. And they created long-term value, and they were true disruptors of civilization in the Mediterranean world at that time. And they also became a great geopolitical and military power as well, particularly the Mycenaeans. They created prosperity through their initial innovation in wine and olive cultivation, industries that today continue to be those in which Greece has tremendous brand and prestige and capabilities for the future. But these people and the culture, they looked outward. They did not look inward. They were shipbuilders. They were traders. They moved not only throughout the Mediterranean world, but we know the Mycenaeans went all the way up to Cornwall to source their tin for their bronze that gave them a huge military advantage. They also created one of the first sophisticated, measurable logistic supply chains, which you see in the Linear B writings and the most recent find of Linear B tablets. It's absolutely spectacular. And also, I want to mention this because I have a comment at the end of my remarks to sort of tie together some thoughts that have emerged today about women, that women were very powerful in the Bronze Age civilizations of the Minoans and Mycenaeans. Not only in religious, but in political world. You see this in Homeric writings. You see this in the magnificent frescoes, the dress, the textiles. Women played an absolutely critical role as innovators and as full participants in that society. These people were risk takers and they reaped many rewards. So let's just move fast forward to the present. And I'll use the letter T as a little bit of alliteration here because we are all living here in Greece, around the world, in a time of tremendous turbulence, a time of tension, a time of tribulation, a time of no trust, a time of transition, and ultimately, yes, it's going to be a time of absolute transformation. And so one of the issues that I want to bring out that we all need to recognize and understand and accept that we are living in a time in which two great ages of industrial innovation and wealth are in disruption and transition. The rules of 20th century production and services no longer exist. They are gone. And the 20th century business models are gone. This is very important because strategies at the political, national level, and at the private sector level that try to go back and protect and hold up and hold on to the past 
are, one, not sustainable, and they're not going to get anybody where we want to go in the future. We're seeing, and this is true in the United States, but it's all over, we're seeing great corporations that in a short period of years no longer exist. Their business models are gone. Look what the IT industry has done to everything from the telecommunications industry to the music industry. Now they're into healthcare. Now they're into real estate. You look at Uber and Airbnb. Absolutely amazing because they have created this disruptive service industry. And guess what? They own no assets. Uber doesn't own any vehicles. They don't have any taxis. They don't have anything except a sharing economy and being able to pull together this new model through the power of IT. Similarly with Airbnb. They don't own any real estate. This is absolutely transformative, and we're going to see this disruption play out over and over again. The speed of change is absolutely accelerating at warp speed, and it's not going to stop. So this may sound a little bit uh, scary, and it is, but trying to preserve the jobs and industries of the past, as I said, is not a winning strategy. But right now, and we heard a little bit about this this morning, we see in the U.S. presidential election many of the candidates just trying to do that. They're all competing for who can be more protectionist, who can reject trade, who can talk about things that are really not relevant, relevant for the path going forward. And that is because we're seeing now the real social as well as economic challenges of many people who have been displaced and hurt by this change. We also in the United States have increasing inequality, and we have statistics that show that the middle class is shrinking, and we're not seeing wage increase in that important middle class. So we have these issues to deal with as well. Now, one of the things I want to talk a little bit about is that the good news is we're lucky as human beings to be living in the midst of one of the greatest times of scientific and technological revolutions that ever existed. And these revolutions are colliding, they're complex, and they are ultimately converging. So some of you know I love to say this little thing. I created this. I'm very proud of this concept that the IT revolution, the biotech revolution, the nanotech revolution, the cognitive revolution, they are absolutely rewriting our world in digital code, in genetic code, and atomic code and neural code. And not understanding that and participating in this is going to have a huge impact on which countries and parts of the world will be the winners of the future and those who will have to be behind and will try to come up into that world. This is also coupled now to incredible changes in 21st century manufacturing. Not too long ago in the United States, everyone said, manufacturing, it's dirty, dumb, disappearing, gone. Manufacturing is smart, it's safe, it's sustainable, and it's surging. And in the United States, we've been doing everything in public-private partnerships to come back and be a great 21st century manufacturing nation. And this is going to be driven by automation and sensors and advanced materials and a whole new set of workforce skills. So people that were trained to work in a 20th century factory, they're not going to be able to work in a 21st century advanced manufacturing environment. So we have to couple the training with the technology and the revolution and how things are designed and made. And then on top of that, you add the energy revolution. Yes, we're ultimately moving to a non-carbon world. We have the Paris talks, the commitment towards renewables and reducing climate. But also we're seeing in energy the tremendous potential to take all sources of energy and put them into safe, sustainable, self-healing electric grids, reduce the price, get rid of many of the uh, disruptions of power that make our lives so difficult and costly. One of the good things in the United States was we had a regulatory environment that enabled our shale gas revolution. And we see that as a transition to the future clean energy world, but in the meantime, accessing our shale gas completely changed our competitiveness in manufacturing. Unbelievable. And it's because we did research and development, we enabled individual entrepreneurs, and we had a situation where individual landowners could put their land in play to be part of the shale gas revolution. 
Then, you know, we think of this Internet of Things that's underway, everything being connected. That's really obsolete, too, because it's not the Internet of Things. It's the Internet of Everything. Everything is connected. There's massive amounts of data. Again, huge opportunities and huge challenges. One of the challenges being the cybersecurity area. Every major U.S. corporation has been attacked in massive cyber attacks, and they're not going away. This is huge and it's pervasive, has huge economic and national security issues as well. But also these revolutions are going to be the way and the tools and the processes where we're going to be able to solve some of the grand challenges of this, of this time and the time of our children. Everything from the need to triple global food production, to have clean water, to deal with health and pandemics, to deal with the more and more of the people that are living in complex urban environments. All of this depends on the new science and technology revolutions and the products and services that derive from those. So in this environment, there's only one path for the future, and that's innovation and disruptive innovation. So let me turn to the concept of what's a uh, strategy for Greece. Well, I hope I've set up, you know, the positive for you. The Greece is, oh, Greeks have always been innovators. It's in your DO, DNA. So embrace that and innovate your way into sustainable growth. So here are a few thoughts about what you can do to drive productivity and also deal with the inclusive challenge of job creation in this country. One is that Greece has to continue to accelerate the reduction in public sector employment. And Greece has to increase the role, the role and prestige of the private sector in your economy. Two, Greece has to dissemble the deep entrenched administrative bureaucracy, the Byzantine web of business hostile regulations that have no transparency and that provide no business certainty. This system has to go and it has to be dismantled. The deep state bureaucracy is not only innovation hostile, it also stifles creativity and imagination. It has a huge disincentive to FDI. I know many very interesting industries that might want to come here and they said, oh, we can't come to Greece because of the bureaucracy. You don't want that. Get rid of that. Another example is, in terms of the bureaucracy, think of Gulliver in Gulliver's Travels where the giant is pinned down to the ground, you know, with a thousand ropes of the Lilliputians. Think of your bureaucracy that way. It's this tapestry of all these regulatory threads and the government and the private sector need to come together and start cutting those threads and weave a new tapestry that's innovation friendly. So a goal should be by the end of 2017 to get rid of 20% of the existing regulations and create a process of regulatory assessment to really cut these out. One more minute, please. One yeah. more minute. Thank you very much. The third is opening the economy to competition. You have to have creative destruction. I've talked a little bit about that as well. And last, I want to talk a little bit about people and the innovation system here that nurtures that. Again, we'll look back in classical times. I don't think that Plato and Aristotle and Socrates actually got permission to create the Academy of Athens. It's time for Greece to open up its higher education system to get a private university, and we have a, a colleague from Turkey here. I've spoken many times at Coach University and Sabanji University, unbelievable institutions. How about getting a coalition of the Greek ship owners to actually invest and create a fabulous private university in Greece? And finally, I want to say you have tremendous talent here in software and IT. Create a national cybersecurity corps. Take advantage of the national security situations in this part of the world. Be the place that comes up with some of the cybersecurity capabilities that can be deployed throughout the world. Now, next year, I hope we have the forum, and there are a lot of wonderful women that are here speaking and participating, so I hope we could have some fun at the Castilian Springs, and maybe we can have a contest of some of the ladies who might be willing to um, don the costume of Pythia, I will volunteer. And we need to um, actually have a game where we all predict the future of Greece. So I will tell you what my prophecy is already. It is innovate or evaporate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very...